some more research. Re I'm sorry, research on it, and um, pull things together and give him some idea of what we could do at the hospital level to create a program for this procedure. So that's what I did and in the meantime my friend scheduled surgery and I flew out there with her. I was in the operating room when Dr. Barnett did the surgery and I was amazed. I'd never seen a surgery like that before, especially up close. I stayed with her for a couple of days and came back very enthusiastic and that's really the beginning of the Continentostomy Center. That day we started planning everything and um, it's just evolved today to what it is. It's a, it's a wonderful procedure. It wasn't long before a deal was struck. Dr. Barnett would move his BCIR practice to the Palms of Pasadena Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida. Dr. James Pollock was the first to be trained and he would eventually do more than 1,000 BCIR surgeries. Dr. Ernest Rinke also trained under Dr. Pollock and has performed approximately 500 BCIRs to date. Besides St. Petersburg, Dr. Barnett also trained surgeons in St. Louis, Dallas, and California. Although there was still strong opposition to his procedure, the BCIR was now well documented in medical journals and patients from across the nation were benefiting from it. Dr. Barnett was first and foremost an academic surgeon. He was at the University of Mississippi for a long time, uh, I want to say in excess of 20 years. Uh, and um, only in the, at the end of his career did he uh, strike out in, in the private sector. Uh, so he was well familiar with training residents, with teaching medical students. So he was, a, he was an excellent teacher. And there's something about Mississippi people that, that uh, they tend to be good teachers, or at least my experience with Mississippi people are that they were good teachers. My old chief of surgery was a Mississippi person, and uh, I know several uh, strong acad academicians that were Mississippi people. And uh, the, the culture must be such that they, they train good, good teachers. Uh, Dr. Barnett certainly fell into that. I'm Katherine Jeter and I am an anterostomal therapist. I was one of the first 21 who met together at the Cleveland Clinic in 1969 when Dr. Turnbull and Norma Gill named the specialty as enterostomal therapy. I guess the reason that I so wanted to talk about Dr. Barnett and how much I admired him and actually really loved him, though I didn't know him all that well, but he was such a lovable person that it didn't take long uh, to have those feelings for him. But I, I think that he was the kind of brilliant man and the kind of compassionate man that was always looking for something better. And I think that, of course, the coat pouch captured his imagination as well, but as the difficulties uh, and complications of the coat pouch arose, I think he, he realized I can, I can do better than this. I, I, can, I can fix these problems and create uh, a continent reservoir that won't be plagued uh, by the problems that the Coke pouch had. And so he pursued that. And I, I think, as I think about Dr. Barnett, his would have never been the kind of competition that um, athletes have, I want to do better than the other person, or in medicine, I want to get to a, um, a research goal or to an accomplishment faster than somebody at the University of Pennsylvania or the St. Elsewhere Hospital, but his was simply making something better for the patients. And that's what made him so special. And that's what made the Coke, the Coke pouch um, not fall into disfavor, but the realization that the BCIR had definite advantages and patients could rely on it and, and feel certain that they were not going to have the complications that had plagued the Coke pouch. Dr. Barnett had a reputation uh, of being outside the mainstream, off the main line, and I couldn't wait to meet him because of that. And I had in my mind, though I knew it couldn't be so because of the patients I had already met 
who had had the BCIR, but I had in mind that he would be arrogant because he was a visionary. And visionaries often are arrogant, not because they're snobby, but because their mind is on whatever it is that they have a vision about. And I've always said when I've talked to people that um, obstacles are what you see when you take your mind off the goal. And obviously, Dr. Barnett was goal driven. He was going to perfect his continent ileostomy and then he was going to be certain that people knew that that procedure was available. So if he were outside the mainstream, if he were off the main line, it was because he didn't want to take his eyes off the goal and so sometimes he stepped on the obstacles or he bruised the obstacles or they came back and bit him uh, because he was going too fast and people weren't quite catching up with his vision. And I was so amazed when I met him to find such a gentle, compassionate man. And no doubt he stepped on some toes along the way. No doubt uh, he bypassed some well-honored traditions of the way to go through medical research, medical procedures, the medical community. I remember when his advertisements began to appear and I remember uh, mainline surgeons grousing and grumbling about these advertisements. And I can't remember what decade that was, but it was before physicians and surgeons advertised. Oh my goodness, just move forward to 2010. And here we have advertisements on television, we have advertisements in, in magazines, we have advertisements in Sunday newspaper supplements. Everybody's advertising something, a tummy tuck, a, a laser surgery, get rid of your veins, whatever it is. He simply had set the trend because he didn't want to wait uh, for the 10 years or the however long it was going to take for the research to bear out his, his belief and conviction that his procedure was successful, it was successful on his patients, and so he simply moved forward. God bless him. Dr. Barnett was 65 by now, and he had a good feeling that the BCIR was here to stay. He was ready to go home, back to Jackson. He was enjoying the letters and telephone calls from across the country, thanking him for his innovative gift. He had changed people's lives for the good. When I see that little book, The Barnett Continent Intestinal Reservoir, he said, I'm ready to go to the cemetery. I had a happy life. I've accomplished about everything I set out to do. Dr. Barnett said goodbye to Florida and drove his white Jaguar back to Jackson. When he got there, he called Dr. Hardy, his teaching friend at the university. A lot had happened since he left. They had a lot to talk about. Dr. Barnett died in Jackson at the age of 72. Many of his patients from across America attended the funeral in Jackson and followed the hearse to the Barnett Family Cemetery in Tuscola, Mississippi, where it all began. Um, I went to the funeral of Dr. Barnett in Jackson, and I'll never forget the ride from the church through the streets of Jackson, down the highway, back up to his family cemetery in Tuscola. Every car on the road pulled over. It had a, a police escort. The policemen would block the door, the uh, streets ahead of us so that there would be no traffic. And as we drove by, um, people would put their hands on their hearts. And it was a tribute to a very special man. And I could hardly keep from crying even now when I talk about it. He was a very, very special man. When Dr. Barnett passed away, um, Mrs. Barnett immediately notified me. And I went to Jackson. And when I got there, 
and met her, the first thing she said to me was that she wanted me to do his eulogy at his funeral, which was going to be the next morning at 11 o'clock. And it was uh, probably the most frightening thing that I've ever uh, thought about doing, but it was one of the greatest honored honors that I've ever had uh, to do, was to do his eulogy at his funeral. It was really difficult to do, but all the time I was doing it, and I've had many people ask me since then, uh, how did you do that? And the only reason, only way that I could do it was that I envisioned him uh, the entire time looking at me and saying, Velma, you can do this, you know, whatever it takes, because that was his motto. And so that's how I got through his eulogy. Hi, I'm Dr. Ernie Renke, and uh, I'm very thankful for this opportunity to, to be able to share just a little bit with you all. Uh, I came into the program just a little bit later um, I like a lot of sports and sports uh, analogies, so uh, I think maybe uh, I was kind of down in the minor leagues uh, when, uh, when this all got started uh, and certainly was aware of um, some of the procedures that were being offered out there. Um, but towards the end of Dr. Barnett's time, uh, and obviously Dr. Pollock was extremely busy, uh, I was fortunate enough to be asked uh, by Dr. Pollock in the hospital to start considering doing this procedure. And I think as, as you'll probably hear from all of us that are talking today, what's the really neat thing is that we really got introduced to a family. Uh, that family does all get tied together by QLA uh, and I just can't overemphasize the importance of that uh, to not only the patients but us as docs as well too and, and just could not be more thankful for the insight and uh, forward thinking that Dr. Barnett had to try to put this organization together. Certainly as each and every one of you know the procedure itself is a tremendous blessing to be able to, to truly give you quality of life. And it's uh, even more of a blessing, I think, to be able to be a part of that family. That family has been tied together at, at multiple levels with different people at different times. And that's what makes a family strong, uh, the ability to come together at, at times of toughness. Uh, certainly, as we lost Dr. Barnett and then subsequently Dr. Pollock, uh, it does just make the family stronger. And I was fortunate enough to have spent many years, especially with Dr. Pollock, um, as we started to do these procedures, essentially all of them together, you know, for many, many, many years. And, and the camaraderie in the OR, out of the OR, related to the procedure uh, is, is truly what you which you take home as the, your greatest blessings. Uh, hi, I'm Sherwood White, and I was president of this organization, the QLA organization, in 1994 and 95. And um, it was uh, it was the year, and one of the, one of the years when I see Dr. Barnett passed away, I believe, in 1995. And um, uh, I was on the board 18 years, worked with uh, finances and everything. Um, saw it go from uh, the beginnings until a first-class organization that can uh, stand on its own two feet. When, we, uh, when, I, when I was president when Dr. Barnett di died, but just before he died, we went to a, we went to a, um, uh, up to his uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and we gave him this resolution, and it basically uh, talked about whereas um, he pioneered the effort to transform the coach pouch into the BCIR, and he demonstrated uh, devotion to the, uh, great devotion to the cause. And whereas he pers persevered in the, in the face of skepticism, he uh, uh, traveled at his own expense throughout the United States, uh, telling people about it and, and teaching others about it. He was a tirelessly spread the news. His attentiveness to his patients led to him realizing that we needed a network and we t it turned out being a support group and turned out being the QLA which has actually been the lifeblood of the whole uh, movement here 
He was instrumental in launching the Quality of Life Association 